got to mobilize everybody. What can one person full of Jesus, full of the Holy Ghost do? It's the only hope. Another great spiritual awakening. We can convince people that this war is real. He says, but the media. You know, you created the Federal Reserve in 1913 through lies. First, to prepare the United States for foreign war under the guise of American defense. Let me take a few minutes tonight and just uh, share what dropped in my spirit and it will give you opportunity to see it. Go with me to John chapter 2. You know, this year we called, uh, the Lord gave me the title, the year, the more excellent way. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to read from verse 1 from the Amplified. He said, on the third day there was a wedding in Cain of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited with his disciples to the, to the wedding. And when the wine was gone out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no more wine. And isn't that just like a mom to push her boy to go do something? Because she knew there was something special about him, even though he did not performed one miracle. So she was getting impatient, and she was about to get the show on the road. Amen. And Jesus said to her, dear woman, what is that to you and to me? What do we have in common? Leave it to me. Or, you know, my time, my time, my hour to act has not yet come. His mother said to the servant, so she did, she'd like overrode him. I'm your mama. And this is the way things are going to be. And then she says to the servant, whatever he says to you, do it. That little line there seems so simple, but yet it's so profound. Because no matter what, if you find yourself in this here, when it comes to provision, all you have to do really is to stop and listen. And whatever he tells you to do, do it. That's all. It's not complicated. She never said, I want, I want you old people need to start praying right now. We need, we, we need a miracle. Some said, oh, no, my God. Has it come to that? We need a miracle. She said, whatever he saith to you, do it. The miracle comes in the doing of what he tells you to do. And the fact of the matter is when he said, my sheep know my voice, the voice of a stranger that I'll follow. So I know when God speaks to me and the Lord will speak to me. And the way I do, I always do it. And maybe this is not the way you're supposed to do it, but it's the way I was taught anyway, because out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So I don't maybe act immediately. I mean, I, I act as immediately when I know it's the Lord. Are you with me? So the, I get the impression because you know people think it's going to be like an audible voice speaking to you, but it doesn't work out that way. God drops in your spirit. I want you to do this. Then it's not long. I mean, I'm not talking about two days later. I'm talking about it'll come again. And then, you know, I just wait and then it'll come the third time. The moment it comes the third time, I know. I've already been, you know, the other night we were leaving a place and um, th these people, uh, we, and we were actually in Alexandria, Louisiana. And they fed the whole team, you know, and I don't think they had prepared for us because the pastor wanted to take us to some American restaurant that was just a chain restaurant. I said, Pastor, we in Louisiana. I don't want to eat no Outback Steakhouse. Lord have mercy. We want some gumbo. You know, you, you only have an opportunity to be in Louisiana. You know what I mean? One night, give me some gumbo. And so he called one of the members of church who said that he was making gumbo. So I don't think they were making it for us, but they didn't. They turned around and made everything for us. And they showed up at the house with the greatest gumbo both sides of the Mississippi, man. Make you want to slap your mother, you know. 
And so, I mean, it was just great. And, and they even got there late, you know, we had to rush to the service, but we were waiting and they kept saying they were coming, they kept saying they were coming. So I know they put themselves out for us. Anyway, we ate the meal, it was phenomenal. And, uh, you know, cost me about two pounds that I ended up putting on, you know, which I shouldn't have done, but, <laughs> you know. And uh, anyway, so we go to the service and uh, preach, and, and uh, right after the service, I was walking out. I saw them sitting on the side, and then the Lord said to me, I want you to give them, I want you to hand, give them some cash. You know, I, I, I had $500 that I pulled out, and the Lord said, I want you to give it to them. I heard that, and I didn't. And I turned around, and I was walking because we, we had to get to the plane. And the Lord said, I said, give them that money. And I turned right around and I chased him into the side room there. I said, excuse me. And I just put it in his hand and then disappeared. Because I know, you know, you, I would be flying without doing what the Lord said to do. Are you with me? And I'm talking about me personally. I'm just talking about me personally doing that. I'm not even talking about from the ministry. Some say, you know, I'll give me your bank account, we'll send you some money. No, the Lord said, you give to them. So I've learned you have to be obedient when God speaks to you. Are you with me? There many times I'm with uh, pastors and they bring their kids and the Lord, I will always, I give them each $100. I mean, right before that, uh, one of the associate pastors had these four kids. There. I pulled out four crisp $100 bills and put it in the, in the hands of the kids. Somebody said, why? They'll never forget that. They will never forget the day that a preacher came their way and gave them $100. Amen. Amen. I bumped into your boy in Atlanta. You know what he said to me? We, he's pastoring now one of the, one of the branch churches. We, we were playing golf together. He said, yeah, I met you with my dad. And he said, I'll never forget, you gave me 100 bucks." I've never forgotten that. And then he said, that we were in the restaurant and there was a waitress there and she was, was sick. And he said, all these preachers, says, you jumped right up and grabbed a hold of her and started praying for her. He said, that hit me. Who's this man? So sometimes we try to stay in, you know, I just don't want to, you know, I'm not going to do anything or whatever. And I'm not saying this yet. You know, somebody said, well, you shouldn't let your left hand uh, know what your right hand's doing. Look. I'm, I'm just telling you from a practical standpoint that you just have to obey the Holy Ghost when God speaks to you to do what he tells you to do. Otherwise, what happens is God speaks to you and then you walk away, you don't do it, and then you keep saying, I should have done that, and you know you should have done that. Amen. Amen. And the secret to provision in your life is, to const is a constant flow of provision from you. Because everything we have is not our own. We're actually just stewards of it. Are you with me? We had a kid uh, come to Bible school. He was totally messed up. But when he was five years old, I was preaching in New York. And I handed him 100 bucks. And then I said, when, when you get old enough, you're going to come to Bible school. Well, the kid goes up and he goes into drugs. And he's following the footsteps of his father, who now is a preacher but was a drug dealer. And he was driving down the road and hit a car. And an old lady in the car died. And he got out and he knew, I'm going to prison now because that's manslaughter, whatever, you know, whatever they'll do in New York City. And so he said, God, if you get me out of this, I promise you I'll serve you. And the lady went like this. The old lady went, <laughs> and started breathing. And another car pulled right up and a lady got out and said, don't you ever forget the vow you just made to God. I mean, let, let, yeah, right, right there. Then he goes to his father and said, do you think the offer, remember when Pastor Rodney gave me that $100, he said that I could go to Bible school. I'm not talking about a kid messed up. I mean, he messed up, still messed up. Do you think that that offer still stands? And he came to Bible school. And now he's back helping his dad in the church. Come on. 
You know, many times we teach these things, people think it's just about an offering, but it's actually not. It's about a lifestyle of what you're going to do because anybody can give an offering. People bucket plunk all time, all day, all day long, throw something at the Lord. But it's about being a distributor of that which the Lord has entrusted to you. Can you say amen? amen. And being ready to give whatever God tells you to do. God said, you know, I, as far as I'm concerned, if it's not bolted down, it's going. If God says go, it's leaving, it's leaving, it's going. Many times, clear out things. I, I, and I don't want to get into specifics about it because people get mad some of the stuff I give, you know. So I'll just be quiet about it. But, you know, and then the harvest comes back of those things. Amen. So don't be attached to anything. But anyway, get back to this now because I don't want people, you know, coming under conviction here or anything. Because that's not the purpose of this. <clears throat> just, you know, when you go home, just tell the Lord, I'll do whatever you tell me to do, you know. Okay. So whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six water pots of stone standing there as the Jewish custom of purification ceremon ceremonial washing demanded, holding 30, uh, 20 to 30 gallons apiece. And then Jesus said, fill the water pots to the wa to, to, with water. So they filled them to the brim. Now you think about this. What were they lacking? They were lacking wine. So what is he telling me to do? He's telling me to do something that's totally crazy. You want to go, excuse me, Lord, please. You know, okay, they need wine. They don't need water. This is not going to turn out well. But go back to the words of Mary. Whatever he says to you, do it. But, but this is ridiculous. But sometimes in order to see the miraculous, you have to do the ridiculous. It doesn't make sense to the natural mind. And we always, in our natural mind, want everything to make sense. Amen. This Cape Town crusade that we're going to, in two and a half weeks, we'll be standing on the field. And when we first sent Pastor Derek and Cheryl there over there now with the team on the ground, when we first sent them over there, we were going to use a, a certain uh, a field and we, we had a, a, a 6,000 seat a tent, like a marquee that was going to go up. And then Pastor Derek said, Pastor, we, we have a few weeks now, but then by, the, by about the 8th or 9th, uh, maybe the 10th of December, the whole of South Africa shuts down. Basically, everybody goes AWOL till about the 10th to 15th of January. And there's no ways that we can get this land cleared for the meeting at all. Plus, the roads coming in, the moment you televise it, as it's going to be across the, the, the continent of Africa, people are going to start coming in. There's going to be problems with roads, with traffic. We, we have to do everything from the ground. You know, it's, it's just, it was insurmountable, the stuff that needed to happen. And so, then the next thing I knew, they had a high winds and the tent was ripped to shreds. So now we have no tent and we can't clear the land. So I said, okay, well, just let's, po post let's postpone it. I'll, go, I'll come the end of 2018. We'll, we'll do it at a better time. This is not the better time. And then the Lord began to deal with me. You know, we come, we come through the Christmas period, and I, I felt the stirring in my spirit. You, can, you cannot leave this thing. There's, there's the killings going on. There are 56 murders a day. There's, it is, it, the country is standing on the brink of a civil war. Besides that, the city we're going to is going to run out of water by April. There will be, and I'm talking about a major city. Imagine a city, oh, how many million in, in, in the area? What, four million? Yeah, four million. A city of four million people, no water. They're already lining up for water. They're telling your body to shower in 90-second showers. So you're talking about a crisis situation in the nation. Somebody said, well, what's that to you? You live over here, but there's family, there's believers living there. And they're praying. And so in my spirit, I heard the Lord say, go stand on a field in the shadow of the mountain. If you can put the, the picture up for me. Go stand on a field. And I just thought, I'm not getting a bill. We then found, that's it there. That's a cricket ground. That's Table Mountain in the background. And keep it up while I'm talking. 
listen, we found another place that we're, they're going to break down. They're going to break this auditorium down to seat 6,000. And they said they, were, they actually called us and said, we'll give it to you for almost next to nothing. But I knew that were, that was moving the thing up into the northern suburbs that was going to take us away from where we need to be with all the townships, you know, easily accessible. And then and the Lord said, just run 100 buses a night and bring the people to the field. I'm putting out 10,000 uh, chairs and 100, bu 100 buses, that's 8,000 people, leaving the door open for other situations to come and, and just go stand every night, preach the gospel, and then issue a restraining order and then come against the drought and break the drought. Amen. Yeah. And I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, in the natural, you know, you're asking me to do uh, something like fill water pots with water. But I've learned a long time ago, all God needs from us is our obedience. He's just looking for a person that will say, okay, thank you. You can take that down. So the Bible says, he said to them, now draw some out and take to the manager of the feast, to the one presiding, the superintendent of the banquet. So they took some, and when the manager tasted the water, they now turned to wine, not knowing where it came from. Though his servants who knew had drawn the water, he called the bridegroom. Now, so the miracle took place as they drew it out. It probably was still water, but as they drew it out, you know, somebody said, we're not going to have the provision. Can you imagine the embarrassment of them drawing out the water and then handing it to the people and they taste it and they say, this is just water. It would, have, it would have wrecked the wedding. It would have been a total embarrassment to everything. Somebody said, well, I don't want to do that. That's just totally crazy. We're going to be embarrassed. We, and, and the Bible says that if you believe the Lord, you will not be ashamed. Can you say amen? amen? That if God tells you to do something, then the Lord's going to come through with it every single time as he always has. How many have ever found yourself in a situation and you thought to yourself, I'm never going to get out of this one. And then God tells you what to do and then he does it again. He brings that miracle happens again and again and again and again. Every time. He's not failed one time. He's not failed one time. He, he hasn't failed you before. For the students here tonight, Think of the miracles it took you to get to RBI. Did the Lord come through for you? How many think is going to come through for you the whole time you get? What about when you launch out like Yana, like Shanna? What do you think about when you launch out? Huh? You think he's going to come through for you? Or is it only Yana that God's going to come through for? No, he's going to come through for you too. Just like he came through for us when we came to America with $300, 30 years ago now. And then you think about it, this last year, we go into the White House and lay hands on the President of the United States. You know, very surreal. You landed the country with $300, now you're laying hands on the President of the United States. How's that even possible? Who could even script that? So now what's God going to do with you? Where's the Lord going to take you? Where's God going to put you? But it all comes by one step of obedience off to the next step of obedience. Like that total stranger, pay for that meal, fill that tank of gas. Buy that lady that cart of groceries right now. She's standing at the checkout. She's trying to get her coupons together and say, you know what? I'm going to pick up your groceries. What do you mean? You're picking, I'm going to pick up your groceries. Buy that person's meal. You sit in the restaurant and you can see they're trying to go Dutch and they're splitting the thing. I've done that. I've seen senior citizens sit right there and then I just flag the waitress down and say, I'm picking that up. And then they, and they're blown away. Why would you do that? Because it can. I mean, I tell some of the ridiculous stuff, you know, that happens and has happened over the years. I was preaching Virginia Beach, Virginia years ago. And I wanted to get a new computer. At that time, I, was, I actually, it wasn't long after uh, 
probably, it doesn't matter when it was. It, it, it was in the early 90s. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. You know, you try to get into dates and stuff and it all runs together for me. You know, I, <coughs> anyway, so I, I said to the person with me, I said, find me this computer store. And they said, Pastor, there is none, but there's another one uh, that's there. I said, okay, let's go there. So we get to the computer store, and the one I'm looking for is right, is a new one. So it wasn't listed, but they'd obviously come and built it. So we, we walk in the computer store, and I come right up to the counter, and um, I'm uh, looking at computers. And the, the, the guy behind the counter, he looks at me, and he goes, what do you have, Brown? What are you doing here? I said, I've come to get a computer. He said, I, I saw you on television. And as I looked up at him, the Lord said, I want you to give him $200. And I go, what? Oh, well, are you kidding me? I, I, I said, Lord, I actually came, I came here to buy a computer, you know, seriously. And the Lord said, give him 200 bucks. So I took $200, gave it to him, and the guy disappeared. Poof, gone. I'm standing like this, like, hmm, hmm, at the, at the counter, just like no, no computer guy. I'm, I'm not even being helped anymore. He just disappeared, gone. Five minutes go by, seven minutes go, 10 minutes go by. <clears throat> I thought, what happened to the guy? Did he take the money and run? I, I didn't know. I didn't know what the story was. So I called and one of the workers over said, can you please come here? I said, there was a guy helping. <laughs> there was a guy helping here. And I don't know where he's gone. Can you find him? You know where he was? He was in the restroom, crying his eyes out. They brought him to me. It was like bringing a little boy that was soft. He was <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the grown man. <laughs> his eyes were bloodshot, red. And I said, sir, are you okay? He said, you don't understand. You don't understand anything. You know what just happened? I said, tell me what just happened. He said, my wife left me. She ran up all the bills. She ran up the credit card. She, he said, I borrowed to the max. And he said, I was 200 bucks short on my rent. And the landlord said to me this morning, I've carried you long enough. If you don't come up with the other 200 bucks, you out on your ear tonight. I'm throwing you out. That's it. It's over and done with and you better have the 200 by tonight. And he said, I'm standing here thinking, I need a miracle. And I, well, this was after morning service, so this was probably like maybe three o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, he probably had like two hours left of the day, you know, of his work. And then he had to go back and pay his bills. And he said, this helps, this helps me right now. He said, when I left the house this morning, I was crying in the car and I said, Lord, I know you love me. It doesn't, I mean, I'm in a total mess here, but if there's some way that you can give me a miracle by the end of the day, I don't, that would really be great. He said, and then of all people, you come. <laughs> you know, that, it, it, you know, it was just, it just blew, blew his mind. So we have to be sensitive to the needs of others. Can you say amen? Yeah. Because I know a lot of times people make this all about an offering, and it's not. Because if it's about an offering, most people are going to do one thing a week and then think they give a, you know, hey, the last of the big-time givers showed up, they gave an offering. Or twice a week or once a month. This is not about an offering. This is about a lifestyle of giving. So God will give it to you, give it through you. The Lord knows you not like the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea has a great inlet and no outlet. And God will start bringing you things that you don't even need so that you have seed. Amen. God will bring you things to give away. Right. You'll be a recipient of things coming to you. Yeah. And I promise you, if you think that praying for people and miracles and all the signs and wonders are great, when you enter a ministry of giving, <laughs> you talk about a joy beyond anything you can ever even begin to imagine. Amen. 
We were coming back from Louisiana. At that time, the ministry owned his own aircraft. We're coming back from Louisiana. The Lord said to me, I want you to land. And he told me the city to land in and call that pastor and tell him to come to the plane and hand him a check. I thought, Lord, I'm trying to get home. I mean, we finished the meeting. I'm trying to get home, you know, landing. And then, you know, you, you come down from altitude, you land. You know, I'm going to write out your check. I said, I send it to him. He said, land the plane? What part of land the plane do you not understand? You know, I mean, because you don't want to tell God. He, he said, I, I can land this thing for you, you know. <laughs> but so just be obedient. And I said to the pilot, listen, we need to stop over here. And we landed the plane. As we came down to altitude, I could talk, called the guy, said, come to the, come to the FBO, flight base operation. He pulled up. I walked right in, hand him the check, give him a hug. I'll see you later. Turn around, walk straight to the plane, get on the plane, took off, and, and we, we came home. There's no, you know, a little extra, but not, no skin off our nose. And then I got so happy flying home. I thought, you know what? I'll just fly around the world and hand out money. I mean, no, <laughs> I felt like that. I felt in my spirit. I, th I said, you know what? If, the, if this is what you want me to do, if you want me to do this the rest of my life of ministry, then just I'll fly around and just drop off money. <laughs> now, something to, that's very interesting here when you look at this. <clears throat> he says here, Everyone else serves his best wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then he serves that which is not good. But you've not kept back the good wine until now. Or you have kept back the good wine until now. Now, here's the thing that you need to watch. This, the first of his signs, miracles, wonders, wonder works, Jesus performed. So, this was not the 40th miracle. This is not the 60th miracle. This is the first one. And when you do a miracle for the first time, you're actually making a statement. So why did he do that? Why was it a miracle of a provision at a wedding? Number one, he likes weddings. That's proven right there. So any young person getting married, you serve God, God will supply everything for your wedding, your honeymoon. Um, I'm telling you, he loves weddings. He'll even supply the rock for the ring. Amen. He loves weddings. Loves weddings. How many of you that, that have got married here at the church, you saw miracles at your wedding? Stand. All the couples that have got married here so far over the last number of years. Come on. You saw miracles. <clears throat> Amen. He said, now we've got couples all over the world now, starting churches and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's miraculous when you begin to think about it, when you, when you see God come into the middle of your life, like something as natural as that. But it says this, the first miracle he did, it was not a miracle of salvation. It was not a miracle of healing. It was a miracle of provision. Why? Because that's probably the least that man needs. Even though man makes it the most of what he needs. The greatest need of man is salvation. After that, the healing of their bodies. And then provision. But the Lord comes along and he does the last thing first. And the first thing he does last, which he dies on the cross of Calvary and then raises from the dead. And in between, what did he do? He goes around and heals the sick. So what is he saying? I'm everything that you need. Whatever you need, I'll save you, I'll heal you, I'll deliver you, I'll provide for you. I don't know what's wrong with people that have a problem seeing the hand of God in provision because I don't see the separation. But, but I, can't, I can't, in my mind, separate this. If Jesus shows up at your house, Whatever's wrong with your house is going to be made right. You, you're about to have a miracle in every area of your life. 
He's not just going to do one thing and not another thing. He's going to do it all. And the fact that he said in doing this miracle, Jesus manifested his glory, which is his goodness. In other words, in doing this miracle, he showed how good he was. So somebody said, well, he was showing off then? It looked like, hey, he was showing off. Yeah, he shows up and shows off his glory. The people were in wonder. They were in amazement at what he had done. Because there's things that he does because he's just good. So somebody said, well, what's the purpose of that? It's just to show that he's good. He's just going to do it because he's good. He's good. He's good. He's good. He's good. He's good. He'll do just what he said he's, he would. He's good. He's a good God. He doesn't save you from hell and make you live in hell all the way till you get to heaven. He said, I'm come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Hallelujah. And you think about it for a moment. I mean, the church is so quickly ready to dispense salvation. And then in a lot of circles, they don't even pray for the sick, so they don't dispense healing because they don't believe that that's available. But healing is available to everybody. Healing is the children's bread. Amen. And that woman that came and provoked him, the Syrophoenician woman, and, 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 you know, he says not right that we should take the children's bread and give it to dogs. So he actually called the woman a dog, and she wasn't offended. She said, that might be fine. That might be true. But even the dogs get the crumbs. And Jesus said, wow, look at the faith of this woman. She could have gone away. She could have got a lawyer, tried to sue him. He called me a dog, you know. And it would be written up in the, in the Christian periodical and it would be posted on the internet and everybody would Google Jesus' name and it was, the headline would say, Jesus called woman a dog. And it would be thing and then nobody would want to work with him because he's just uh, totally rude and totally uncouth. How can you call a woman a dog? But what he was doing was provoking her because she passive faith gets nothing. Everybody has faith. Someone said, I don't have faith. You have faith. Are you afraid? I mean, you know, if people are afraid, they have faith. They have faith in their fears. So you've got faith. Everybody's got faith. God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Some faith is passive. It, 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 it's inactive. It needs to be activated. You put your faith out. Somebody say, well, my, you know, I haven't seen what you see. Well, what are you believing for? Well, not much. Well, then you're getting it. You know, you're getting not much. You know, you have to put your faith out. You have to believe God. You have to, you have to speak it. You have to declare it. You have to believe it. Amen. What are you believing God for? What are you trusting him for? Are you just going through life, allowing whatever to come your way? Well, there's really nothing we can do about it. That's life. Throws you many curveballs. <laughs> God knows I've had many this last year. Yeah, there are twists and turns in the road of life. True. But the Lord, the Bible says, many afflictions are righteous, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. All means all. Because that's what all means. And, and we meet many ministers, and I talk about ministers now, that are just, they're just going along and they just allow anything to come their way. They don't stand up. You have to fight, man. You have to stand up and say, absolutely not. Well, no, no, I draw a line in the sand. This ain't going to happen. 
We don't, we're not even receiving that. We're not receiving that report. You know, somebody said, you mean you're negating what the doctor said? Yes, because I got this book right here, and this says something else. Amen. And whose report will you believe? Let the weak say, I am. Let the sick say, I am. Let the poor say, I am. Oh, you must be part of that name it, claim it, frame it bunch. Yes. Yes. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So God's a name it, frame it, claim it person. Amen. We call those things that be not as though they were. We don't call those things that are as though they are not. We're not mind of a matter, and if you don't have a mind, it doesn't matter. We're not Christian science, we're Christian sense. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we activate our faith. Faith is voice activated. And then faith acts. There's actions to the faith. If you believe, then you, even though you haven't seen the evidence of it in the natural, you start moving in the direction of the miracle and trusting that God's going to come through for you as in filling water pots to the top with water, even though your mind is screaming, even though your head is saying, this is crazy. Somebody said, people are going to think we're out to lunch. What are you t- why are you worried about the people that think you're out to lunch? They haven't even had breakfast yet. What, what's your problem? Yeah, but Brother Rodney, what if we believe that and, and, then, and then we fall on our face? He said he'll pick you up. That's like your kids when they start first riding a bicycle. You know, they got the training wheels on. Well, the moment you take them off, you know they're going to hit the deck. Are you with me? But, you know, they hit the deck. Kids are hardy things. They, they, they hit the deck, they get a couple of scrapes, and then afterwards they don't hit the deck anymore. Kenneth, for whatever reason, he'd always bash himself. He would bash. He couldn't go outside. He would come back with a bash. I thought he was going to be one giant car by the time he was 15. (laughs) Running everywhere, bashing into everything, flying around corners, always bumps on the head. But he doesn't do that now. (laughs) He lets his dad do that. (laughs) I'm I'm teasing it. I'm just teasing. (laughs) Just teasing. Just teasing. Just teasing. Just teasing. So an individual's faith is going to grow. Where your faith is now, there's no way it's going to be two years from now, three years from now. I promise you, when Yana came here, her faith was not where she is now. But 30 countries later, it's a whole different story. When you go into the South Sudan, when you go into Syria, as a, as a, as a young woman, you better be, be, know. You better know. But then she is a little crazy. No, she goes jogging through the streets of Jerusalem at four o'clock in the morning. I was sitting in my house and then the periscope went off. And I look and it's Yana running through the streets of Jerusalem. And I go, oh my God, she's running by herself through Jerusalem. They were stabbing people in one area. Huh? Oh, everybody's sleeping, all the criminals are sleeping? Oh, the stabbers are sleeping? Oh, who knew that? That's a great time to run. Yeah, I'm running because the stabbers are sleeping at 4 a.m. They awake when, you know, when the sun comes up. Sorry, didn't realize the reasoning behind running at 4 a.m. in the morning. But I do think the stabber would have a little shock when 
when the lady has a black belt. So I think the stabber would, you know, it wouldn't be his good day. You start off, you wobble, you fall, but then you get the hang of it. And then you know what to do. It's the same with your faith. So Jesus showed forth his glory and he displayed his greatness and his power openly and his disciples believed in, adhered to, trusted and relied on him. And, and, and we could go, we could talk about the miracle catch, the Peter's boat was used, and there were the net breaking boats and a load of fish. We could talk about when they needed the tax money, and he said to Peter, go fishing, take the first fish, and take the coin out of its mouth. Probably Peter caught another fish and just checked. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. He caught another fish and just said, I just have to check this out. The miracle of the five loaves and two fish, the feeding of 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, taking a little boy's lunch, multiplying it, all, all these things in the natural are ridiculous. But yet, they resulted in sustenance. And I want to just decree this over you today that 2018 will be the year, the more excellent way where you see the supernatural power of God in manifestation for provision in your life to accomplish that which the Lord has called you to do. Because if miracles are available, you might as well have them then. I mean, I'm just a simple person in the fact that I come from Africa and I read a book and believe every word of it. So if they could see the supernatural, I'm not going to get to heaven and then the Lord said, come here, let me show you all the miracles that were available to you in all of these areas, but you only put your faith out for certain areas. You are only trusting me. And, what, and I'll just say this, whatever you believe God for, you'll get. You know, whatever you believe God, it's a fact. It's a fact. Whatever you believe God for, you'll get. And I believe God for souls. Now what we're sitting at, in just in the last, in, now into the eighth year, 14 minutes, and a total of, what's it, 19 minutes. I'm believing God for 100 million souls. You'll get whatever you put your faith up for, you'll get. And they'll go in every single area of your life. Physical body, believe God for a wife, you get a wife. You believe God for children, you get children. There's, there's a church in Nigeria, and I'm just picking on them, but they have ladies, listen to me, this will, sound, this will shock you, but they'll have ladies that are 56 years old that are having babies. Because they were barren and they heard the preacher preach that God will give them the child. So they just begin to believe God. And they're 56 years old and they're having children. Somebody says, no, Paul, go, go to Lagos, go find out. It's happening. They get up on the platform and testify. And they bring the baby on the platform. Well, that, that's just impossible. No, Sarah was older. Sarah was, was 90 years old. So all you ladies out there, I, I'll tell you. I've got some people glaring at me right now. Okay, don't worry about it. It'll never happen. I said... You know, well, I say that, but, you know, Sarah laughed. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> Sarah laughed. <laughs> but Abraham, the Bible says he was 99 years old. Sarah was 90. And the Bible says Abraham was staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able to perform. And I don't need to know the details. I know they got together because it was not an immaculate conception. And I don't, you know, I mean, but a 99-year-old guy and a 90-year-old woman, I mean, he probably was standing outside one day and then he just looked at Sarah and he must have felt the noise and said, get in the tent. (laughs) (laughs) 
I mean, I, I, you know, I, in the tent woman. Yeah, I, I don't know. This is the child of promise. Can you say amen? This is the child of promise. Did God do it? Yes, he did. So people say, well, why won't God do that? He'll do it because he's good. So I decree and declare over you that 2018 shall be the year of the Morrison Way, the year of supernatural provision for your life, for your home, your marriage, your children, your business, your ministry, and for the vision that God has placed on the inside of your heart. And that no plan of the enemy over your life or against your life will come to pass. Every plan of the enemy against your life will fail. When the sun sets on the 31st of December, 2018, you will look back and say, truly, the hand of the Lord was upon my life in a supernatural way. And that not only was there supernatural provision, but there was supernatural acceleration. And I'm not talking about provision just to make it. I'm talking about provision to go over the top with, with surplus, like 12 baskets left over. Hallelujah. Because God is in the multiplication business. Glory to God. Come on, just grab a hold of the word of the Lord tonight. Don't listen to the lies of the enemy. Don't listen to the lies of the devil. Don't listen to the naysayers and the gainsayers. Don't let people tell you because you in this country or that country and they say, well, it's really bad there and things are really in upheaval. It doesn't matter where you are. God will bless you. you. You'll be able to harvest in the midst of hell. I'm telling you, if they say, if nothing else, if, if they could have said, we fish all night and caught nothing, you'll cast your net on the other side. There'll be a harvest that will come in and it will be miraculous and it will be supernatural. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But always remember this one thing. Whatever he says to you, do it. That's it. That's it right there. That's it. That's it. I want you to close your eyes across this room right now. Please, nobody moving just for the next few minutes. It's very imperative as we give this call. If you're here in this place today, you fit in any one of these three categories. I want to pray with you and for you. Maybe you walked in here today, you've never given your life to Jesus. I want to ask you a question, friend. What would happen if today was your last day on the earth? If you went home tonight, put your head on your pillow and breathed out your last breath, where would you spend eternity? I want you to know there's a heaven again and a hell to shun. You don't have to go to a devil's hell because 2,000 years ago on Calvary's cross, the price was paid and the blood was shed. And just like that old song said, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all the guilty stain. Today, the power of sin will be broken off of you. The power of guilt and shame will be removed from your life. You might have come in here one way, but you'll leave another way. He calls you today. Will you surrender? Will you say, Lord, I'm tired of going my own path, but today I surrender and I follow you. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'm gonna give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me. My yoke, is bur my, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He calls you, will you surrender today? Secondly, maybe you've come to this place, you gave your life to the Lord in days gone by, but you've grown cold, you're not serving God like you should. There was a time when you were radically on fire for God, but something happened and you lost that passion. You lost that first love. You lost that joy. You lost that peace. But the Lord's calling you to come back. It's time to fall in love with Jesus all over again. 
Maybe it's something hidden that no one can see. The hidden things of the heart, pride, unforgiveness, bitterness, jealousy, anger, lust, the hidden things. But he said, I will take out the stony heart and put in a heart of flesh. He said, a new spirit will I put within you. Maybe your wife doesn't know, your husband doesn't know, your parents don't know, your children don't know, your pastor. No one knows, but you know it's time to surrender fresh to him today. Maybe it's not hidden. Maybe it's something very outward, very open. Everyone can see it. People know about it. And they even remind you on the anniversary of the event. And so you feel like God will never use you now because of things that have transpired. But that's a lie. God's a God of a new beginning. If you'll surrender to him, a new day, if you'll come to him and humble yourself. Maybe it's not hidden or outward as we described. Maybe it's a storm that came against your life, a sudden divorce, a bankruptcy, the loss of a loved one, a sudden illness, the betrayal of a close friend, the loss of a job. Something happened that rocked your world. I have ministers come to me, say, big churches, they say, man, I was going along and this thing hit me. I, I can't even pray. I can't even read the word. I don't even know how to get back to where I was. The Bible says, many of the afflictions are righteous, but the Lord delivers us out of them all. And today he shall deliver you and bring you back and you'll be stronger than before. Remember, he looks at the temperature of our heart. It's either hot, lukewarm, or cold. And this is not the hour to be lukewarm. This is the hour to be on fire for God. And then lastly, if you're in this place, you love the Lord, that's not even a question. But the devil's always lying to you, telling you that you're not saved. But today, you want to make sure, today you want to know that you know that you know that you know that you're a child of God. If this is you, right where you are, across this place today, won't you quickly just put your hand up and say, pray for me. I need Jesus. God bless you, 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 God bless you. Hands are going up across this room. Put your hand up right now and say, yes, that's me. Yes, that's me. From this day, my life will change. This shall be my year a more excellent way. My way has been hard, but his way is easier. Slip your hand up right now and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. God bless you. God bless you. You can put them down. I want you to look at me now, please. Everybody look at me. In this section here, even under the overhang, if you didn't raise your hand on these invitations, but you want to be included in the prayer, I'm going to pray right now. Quickly, put your hand up and say, include me. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. God bless you. This section here, you didn't raise your hand, want to be included. Put your hand up right now and say, include me. God bless you. Yes. This section here, put your hand up and say, include me. God bless you. Yes. Under the overhang, slip your hand up and say, include me. God bless you. Yes, 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 yes. This section over here, you didn't raise your hand but want to be included. Slip your hand up right now. Say, include me in the prayer. You're going to pray. God bless you. God bless you. I want everyone that lifted your hand, I want you to stand across this place right now. Stand to your feet right now. Everybody that raised your hand, stand to your feet right now. All across this room. Now, I want you to bring your personal belongings, and I want you to make your way down the aisle and come stand around the altar. We're going to pray. Come. I've had the privilege from the very first year of going to ministry in 1980, of doing this literally thousands upon thousands of times. And now people come to me and they will even remember the day when they walked down the aisle and came and stood just like you are. And I want you to know this today. If you mean busy with God, God means busy with you. Whether this is your first time you're coming to give your life to him or you're coming to recommit your life or you're coming to make sure. We're going to pray one prayer, one prayer fits all. I want you to close your eyes right where you are and raise your right hand to heaven. That's where your help comes from. And pray this together with me. Believe it in your heart and say it with your mouth. Say this out loud. Say, Father, I come to you in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Lord, you said in your word, if I confess with my mouth, Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. And I believe in my heart that God has raised you from the dead, I will be saved. So Father, right now, I confess Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. Come into my heart right now. Take out the stony heart. Put in a heart of flesh. Wash me. 
Cleanse me. Change me. Fill me. Use me. Let me never be the same again. I turn my back on the world. I turn my back on sin. And I follow you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. Thank you that on the third day you rose for me. And thank you that you're coming back again for me. From this day on, I'll never be the same again. I confess Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. He is my Lord and my Savior. And right now, by faith in the finished work of the cross and by the shed blood of Jesus, I am saved. Thank you, Lord, for saving me now. Now, Father, I pray that you would seal them now by your blood and by your spirit, that on that day not one would be missing. Raise them up to be mighty men and women of God and use them to profoundly impact the kingdom of heaven. In even this year, beginning this year, we thank you for it. Every power of the wicked ones broken off of them. I send every curse back to its origin. In Jesus' name, we thank you for your blessing upon them now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. convince people that this war is real. He said, but the media. You now you created the Star Reserve in 1913 through lies. First, to prepare the United States for foreign war under the guise of American defense.